Oh, what a rich time of worship this morning. Great picture of Christ, isn't it, in that song? Um, I was listening as they uh, sang this morning, as they practiced, and I asked Jen if we could close with that song. So know that we are going to sing How Great the Father's Love for Us one more time today, all right? Well, we're in the third week of a four week series on how we, the church, we, the body of Christ, engage the culture. And if you've been with us over the past three weeks, but two sermons, uh, then you've heard about the cultural crisis that we're in. Over the 50 past years or so, the American culture has shifted greatly away from the Judeo-Christian values, and it's found itself in a crisis But the bigger crisis is actually in the church. You see, people used to come to church as part of their weekly schedule, but that's not the case any longer. And the church has, for the most part, been declining in numbers over the past decades. In order to reverse that trend, we, the people of God, we, the body of Christ, we have to engage the culture for for the kingdom of God. And we've, you know, we have been given, we, you and I, followers of Jesus Christ, we've been given the one promise of hope that truly delivers. I don't know if you grasp that or not, but there is a whole lot of things that this culture is grabbing for in order to have hope. And when they grab, they all come up empty. But the promise of hope that Jesus Christ gives us is the one promise, the one promise that delivers. And our culture needs to grab a hold of our message and what we have to offer. Today, as I promised last week at the end, we're looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly of how we engage in the culture. To give everybody a fair warning I plan to be an equal opportunity offender today. I have the feeling that by the time I'm done, I'm going to be the least like person in this sanctuary. In fact, I'm prepared to move this music stand to block tomatoes as they fly. I just ask that you would try to look at me with a little bit of grace because I've looked at you with grace as I've written this sermon You ready for this? Last week, we looked at the transformational model. Um, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Uh, And I'm really going to summarize this today uh, because of time. Uh, It's probably the longest manuscript I've ever written, so we're going to kind of book through it. But Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus tells us that we are the salt. We are the light, right? Right? And the transformational model, those who relate to the transformational model and say that is the way that I engage the culture, um, those are the verses of Scripture that they would cling to as their marching orders. The transformational model by way of uh, review is uh, views culture this way. Culture is changed as we live out Christianity in every area of life. Our Christian worldview should drive and be evident in all of our conversations. Uh, The emphasis that the transformationalists would have is on having Christian politicians, Christian businessmen, Christian teachers, Christian actors, all working in and transforming the secular culture. One of the best quotes to emphasize the transformationalist model, it's given, um, it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, although there is some question as to whether he's the one who said it. But, but this is the way uh, that it says. It says, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. In other words, as we speak, there is salt in our words, and the saltiness of our words transforms the culture and moves it toward Christ. There, there is light in the way that we live our life, and as we live our life, out in or our life out in the marketplace, people are drawn to our light and we move them toward Christ. 
there are a lot of good effects in the transformationalist model. In fact, last week when I asked how many of you are transformational, probably a third of the hands, if not a little bit more, went up. Many of you would identify with this model. The transformationalist model is the most aggressive and the most optimistic that culture can be changed by Christ. It's the most aggressive and missional in living out our faith. In other words, we aggressively live out our faith wherever it happens to be, at school, at the workplace, in the marketplace, wherever it is. There's an incredible emphasis on sending missionaries to other cultures in an attempt to see those cultures redeemed and transformed by Christ. In the transformationalist model, every person lives on mission regardless of their occupation. Uh, the, teacher, the teacher is not going to teach in a Christian institution. Instead, they would say, send me to the public school so I can have an impact and an influence toward Christ. The businessman would say, I'm going to take whatever power and influence God gives me in business to change the business world for Christ. The politician would say, God has given me a public platform, and I am going to use it to proclaim his name boldly. Many campus ministries like Youth for Christ and social ministries have formed separate from the church through the transformationalist model in an attempt to change the culture of college campuses and in an attempt to change the social conditions of our culture. Missionaries are sent by transformationalists longing to see the gospel spread to people all around the world. And there's a great emphasis on learning Scripture as a way of articulating and defending the Christian faith. A lot of the great apologists would be transformational in the way that they engage culture. Because they would say, the culture out there won't understand us if we don't have the knowledge to back it up and to convince them. To the transformationalists, in a perfect world, we are all working in the world, sharing our faith stories, bringing glory to God as those in the world's culture find Christ and to begin to live underneath his lordship. Hey, transformationalists, you are right in the way you engage the culture. You're right. But you're wrong too. Here it is. Here's the negative, the bad. When you move to the extreme of the transformationalist model, you start to lose a little bit of the emphasis on the local church. If we're all living out our faith in the marketplace, the local church becomes a little bit more obsolete. In other words, a campus ministry or a small group or a community group is a pretty good substitute for us gathering together on Sunday morning as a local church. Church can start to feel like a little bit more of an obligation instead of a necessary part of your weekly discipline and growth. At the extreme, the transformationalists put too much stock in politics as a way to change culture. Electing Christian politicians who share our values are seen as the greatest hope to transform a culture. In fact, the transformationalists might be nicknamed the praying right. Transformationalism tends to be very triumphal. It can put another conversion on my list. It can become pretty self-righteous. You know, I led three people to the Lord this past month. And it can become overconfident in its ability to both understand God's will for society and to bring it about. At the negative extreme of transformationalism, the church becomes a bunch of annoying Christians who see defeating the culture as an objective and will not stop until the culture looks the way that we think it should. That's happened time and time again in our world 
as missionaries, as American missionaries, have gone to foreign countries to win the culture, not only for Christ, but also to force the American culture on foreign countries. At the negative end of transformationalism, we won't stop until everyone wears a Christian t-shirt, has a My Boss is a Jewish Carpenter bumper sticker, and speaks that strange foreign language called Christianese. You see, what transformationalists really want is we want the culture to assimilate to our culture. That's the good and the bad. Anybody offended yet? The second model that we looked at last week was the relevance model. And I would say about another third of the congregation said, I can relate to the relevance model, pun intended. That's me. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about how uh, to, to win as many as we can, that we should become what we need to, to win them, to win a few, and do what we need to do to adapt to the culture so that we can win a few. You see, in the relevance model, by way of review, Christ is at work in our cultural movements that, that have nothing to do with Christianity. In other words, Christ is working in our government as it moves to care for the common good and justice for all people. He's at work in the medical field as scientists come up with new solutions to health problems. In the church, according to the relevance model, we build from the culture that's out there, the prevailing culture, we build from the culture toward Christ. And we use drama to do that. We use art to do that. We use relevant music to do that. We meet common needs in the relevant model so that we can eventually introduce people to Christ. I think a quote that would summarize this model, the relevance model, is this. The church has left the building. In other words, go out into the world and be relevant. Be a relevant force for the kingdom of God. Go and do good. Go and do good. And there are a lot of good effects of the relevance model. Here's the good part of it. There's a great attempt to tell those who are in the prevailing culture that the church cares about them. And as a result, the lost see that God cares about them. There's a desire to stay relevant to the culture and to use methods that impact the culture as a way of operating within the church and keeping the church relevant. There's a great emphasis on sharing our personal testimony of how God has worked in our life and how he continues to work in our life as a way of being relevant to those who need to know Christ, cares for them, and will work in their life as well. There's a desire and a drive to work for justice and to meet basic needs of the prevailing culture in order to see Jesus have a transforming effect through his church. God wants his people to be engaged in the culture by working toward his purposes of winning people. Churches and individuals who have a tendency to engage the culture through the relevance model will meet people where they are, empathize with their struggles in life, and introduce them to a God who loves them, a God who heals them, a God who understands them, and eventually a God who will save them. And relevance, people, you're right in the way that you engage the culture. But you're also wrong. There are some negatives in the relevance model as we move to the extremes. More than any other of the models, the relevance model blurs the line between what it means to be distinctly Christian and what it means to be non-Christian. The distinctly Christian purposes of the church, in other words, the preaching of the word and the administering of the sacraments, pales in comparison to seeking justice and doing good. 
Therefore, the church becomes irrelevant. T-shirts worn by people who operate in the relevance model would say the church has moved out of the building. And they're a great reminder that we are to serve the culture in an attempt to lead them to Christ. But it becomes dangerous when the church is de-emphasized and the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments becomes secondary to doing good in the name of Jesus. And I would say in the name of Jesus because in the name of Jesus can be dropped off and substituted with doing good. Another danger of the relevance model is that it tends to produce Christians who are spiritual but not very deep in knowledge or understanding of God. Bill Hybels, the pastor, former pastor of Willow Creek Church in Chicago, he admittedly found himself pastoring a church that was very large in number but very shallow in their faith. His members did not have a knowledge of Scripture, and they lacked power in prayer, and they generally did not have a sense that God was at work. I think sometimes in our culture, in our attempt to be relevant, we lose sight of the fact that God is at work. His power is still changing lives. And oftentimes, in an attempt to be relevant, churches and individuals lose sight of the distinctives of Christianity. And the foundation of faith becomes shifting sand. Whichever way the culture shifts, that's the way we're going to go. And there ends up being not much to distinguish a Christian from a non-Christian in their ethical behavior. Along with this is the tendency to engage politically from a social justice standpoint. And for this reason, those who are part of the extremes of the relevance model are not called the praying right, but the praying left. To the relevant, doctrine is meant to change. There's nothing that's black and white, right or wrong. And even the word of God should be altered in order not to be offensive. At its greatest extreme, the relevance model results in universalism, where everyone experiences God's saving grace in the end and will inherit eternal life. That's the bad side of it. The countercultural model The basis, the scriptural basis comes from Jesus' high priestly prayer. I think I'm done offending the majority of the people who are here now, right? Because two-thirds of the congregation was uh, was made up of the relevant and the uh, transformational. And now I'm on the last third, okay? So the biggest number of you can relax and take a breath. If I haven't offended you yet, it's still coming. The scriptural basis for the countercultural model comes from John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, where Jesus is praying for his disciples that, that they would not be taken out of the world, but they would be kept safe in the world. And in the countercultural model, the church becomes that safe place. It becomes a contrast society. Christ is not working redemptively out there in the cultural movements, outside of the church, And so the countercultural is in here. And in the countercultural model, we really should avoid concentrating on ways to transform the culture. And instead, we should be focusing on being a community of love that the world will see as a different type of culture set apart from the world. There are good effects in the countercultural model. The church becomes a safe place for Christians to gather. It becomes a place to belong that's away from the harshness of this world's culture. There's usually a tight-knit family feel in the church that fits into the countercultural model. 
the countercultural um, uh, church is, is kind of a good hospital for wounded Christians that, that have either been beaten up by the world from the hazards of this life, or they've been beaten up by another church experience. And it's a great place to heal and recover. Out of the countercultural model would come things like Christian colleges. Christian colleges have largely resulted from the countercultural model where they have uh, watched other colleges secularize. And as other colleges began teaching from a non Christian worldview, the church has risen up and said, we need to create Christian colleges where, where curricula will be taught from a Christian worldview and will teach our students how to function in this world as Christians. Following that, it sure hasn't taken long for the Christian high school and elementary movement to begin and to offer students a safe place to learn from a Christian worldview. More recently than that, the homeschool movement has, has been embraced by counterculturalists, forming not only homeschool collaboratives for their kids' education, but also their own sporting teams and leagues and art clubs in order to keep their kids from experiencing the impact of our sinful culture too early in life. Counterculturalists, you got it right. But you've also gotten it wrong. The negatives, the bad side of the countercultural model would be this. The, the church quickly becomes very irrelevant. The church protects what it has, and it believes that the culture creeping into the church will destroy it. And as a result, it can be very difficult for a person from outside the church to enter the church. The church becomes so focused inwardly and so protective of itself that it becomes an exclusive club where someone from the outside will not feel welcome or comfortable. The countercultural church will click quickly look differently, act differently, talk differently than the prevailing culture. And although they do not intend for this to be the case, the countercultural church will lose its saltiness. They'll lose their influence for Christ simply because the world does not see the need to be associated with an organization that has no use for them or what they see as valuable. One word comes to mind when thinking about an extreme countercultural church, and that one word is legalism. When the rules for living and protecting the rules for living, in other words, preserving their way of life, becomes more important than the people that they're trying to win for Christ. One more model, the two-kingdom model comes from Matthew 26, 6 through 13, where, where the woman uh, was at Jesus' feet and she was, she was uh, pouring oil into his hair and the disciples looked at her and said, uh, to, said to Jesus, why would we waste all of that money when we could be taking care of the poor? And Jesus replied, you will always have the poor, you will not always have me. And so the two kingdom model recognizes that the culture out there is not going to change. We're always going to have the poor. We're always going to have the sinful. We're always going to have that kingdom out there. But what's important is, is that we find a place to worship in this kingdom and that we grow in this kingdom. It's the common kingdom and it's the redemptive kingdom. And in this model, we work alongside our non-Christian neighbors. We love and serve our neighbors, but we don't impose biblical standards on society. Instead, we appeal to the common understanding of grace, what's good, what's true, what's beautiful. Two kingdom advocates are very guarded about how much improvement, if any, Christians can expect to see in culture. They counsel us to avoid not only triumphalism, but also great optimism. And others said, let's be realistic about how much impact we can have on the culture because 
It'll always be with us. And the two kingdom model demands limited and sober expectations. In this view, the two kingdom view, building up the church through evangelism, discipleship, and Christian community, uh, we build up the church, but worship is the only true redemptive work. And there's a lot of good that comes out of the two kingdom movement. You, you see, you end up with a church that is strong or well grounded in biblical truth. You end up with a church that's focused on deep, authentic worship and has a strong emphasis on corporate and intercessory prayer as it appeals to the common grace of God at work in this world. This model keeps a realism as to how effective the church can can and will be at transforming the culture all around us. I once had a pastor say, you know what, I'm ready to charge hell with a water pistol. I said, yeah, right. Right. That's the two kingdom model. It's it's the reality that the change is limited. The truth is, no matter how hard we work, the culture around us will not be totally surrendered to the lordship of Christ until he returns. And the two kingdoms model keeps that reality there. Two kingdoms people I think all three of you that I'm talking to, you get it right. But you also have it wrong. And there are negatives at the extremes of the two kingdom model. You can live life on religiously neutral terms. Everyone does not have to follow Christ. And as as Christians, we do not have to live like Jesus in our world. You see, what that's really saying is, is that at the extremes... I can come to church on Sunday and worship with all that I am, but because I don't see the change out in the culture, I can walk out of church and live like the world. Jesus doesn't have to be a part of our everyday lives because his grace is all around us and it's revealed commonly to everyone and that's enough. On the negative end of the two kingdoms model, There is an unwillingness to boldly call Christians to work for positive change in their communities and believe that change is possible. There's no need for missionaries because God's grace is revealed to everyone already. There's a hierarchy that happens in the two kingdom model that's unhealthy between the clergy and the people. In the two kingdom model, everyone is encouraged to excel in their occupation, but secular employment is not nearly as important as church work. And therefore, the only occupation that is kingdom work is the hired clergy. It's pretty clear. You can see this mindset at work when someone might say, oh, pastor, you have to go to the hospital to visit me. As if it's not good enough if someone else goes to the hospital to visit. And you end up where in a church where evangelism, discipleship, Christian care is solely the responsibility of elders and pastors, not the regular church members. I'm done offending, I think. Does anyone feel left out? That's the good and the bad. I also said there would be the ugly, didn't I? Last week, I made a comment that there's nothing that divides the church universal, denominations, more than how we engage the culture. I mean, if you think about the labels that we give churches, the evangelical label would be the transformational church. The mainline denominations would be the relevant churches. The the conservative churches would be the countercultural churches. And I can't really think of a denomination that that you would know much about, but but I can tell you this. There is a church in Columbus, a rather prominent church, that operates in the two-kingdom model where, where they emphasize biblical truth and they emphasize establishing community within the church, but it does not emphasize life transformation. So how we engage the culture separates denominations But the reality is 
there are very few things that divide the local church more or creates more conflict within the local church than how we approach engaging our culture. That's a harsh truth. There are a couple models that I'm comfortable operating in. There are probably one or two models that you're comfortable operating in. But when your model doesn't match mine, it makes me uncomfortable. It's especially uncomfortable when I see you going toward the negative extremes. I I made an attempt to try to diagram this. I don't know if you can read this or not, but this is a picture of the interaction between the four models. And over to the right, you have the relevance model and the transformationalist model. Both of those, if you operate in them, you're active at influence the, the, the culture. In other words, we have to do something to reach our culture. Toward the top is full of common grace, so relevance is full of common grace, and transformationalist is little common grace. In other words, we have to take it on ourselves to share the gospel in the transformational model. The relevance model, if we just do good, then Christ will be seen and people will be drawn to him. On the other side, we have two kingdoms that's full of common grace, but we're passive at influencing the culture. In other words, it's more about what we do. We learn about who Christ is. We learn biblical truth. And the counterculturalist is on that side as well. Counterculturalist is or little common grace, two kingdoms is full of common grace, okay? Again, this is not my model. It comes from Tim Keller. If you notice, all four models diverge. And when I say to the extremes, it's down and to the right for the transformationalist and up and to the right for the relevance, okay? I'm gonna kind of use those two as my starting point, Toward the middle, we have some common ground, but when we start to get to those extreme areas, it separates us. And here's my stand. Take it for what it's worth. The way that I engage the culture, that's the right way. You guys need to see things my way. And in fact, when you move to the extreme of yours, man, that angers me. It's embarrassing, quite honestly. It's embarrassing. To me, it's embarrassing that you would move there. I know that when I move to the extreme, that's okay, though. When we get to the extremes and we dig our heels in, we have forgotten some very basic biblical truths. We've forgotten Philippians 2, 3 that says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourself. We've, we've forgotten that one because it is all about the way that I engage the culture. We, we've forgotten the truth of Romans twelve ten that says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. You see, when I dig my heels in and see my way is the right way, I don't care much about you. And I think that's the ugly. And honestly, that's our crisis in the church. I think it's twofold. Number one, it's this. It's believing that the the way that God has wired me is the only right and effective way to reach this culture. We, we probably are going to insist that we're doing it for the good of the church. I mean, if the body of Christ would just come around to doing it the way that I do it, we would be great at reaching our culture. We would see thousands of people transformed and pour into this sanctuary. It's for the good of the church. But when you get right down to the heart of the matter... It's pride that's keeping me from yielding to others or at least conceding that maybe there's value in the way that God wired them and their way could be effective too. 
Here's the second part of the ugly. First part's pride. Second part is idolatry. Hear, Hear me out on this one because we want to engage the culture for Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that what we want to do? Yes? No. You guys have lost you a long time ago. We want to engage the culture for Jesus Christ. So this is kind of tough to hear here. But idolatry gets in the way of us being effective and powerful. You see, each model has its own idol at the extreme. Mark, can you go back to that slide, the the diagram? If we look at the transformationalist model, when we get to the extreme, the transformationalist wants to preserve what we have. And it becomes an idol. It, It looks backward to the good old days. And looking backwards becomes an idol for us, transformationalists speaking. At the relevance model, up and to the right, those who fall within that category, you have an idol too. And your idol is fighting for relevance or fighting for social credibility in the church. And that becomes your idol. You see, the church has to become more credible in this culture. And I'm going to fight for that, and I'm going to fight for that, and I'm going to fight for that, and all of a sudden, I'm worshiping that. The counterculturalist down and to the right, at the extreme, the church becomes an idol. The church becomes an idol. And we start to worship the church and preserving the church as it is. And if we go up to the two kingdoms... The culture becomes an idol. Because we can live like the church one day, but I'm going to fully give myself to living in the culture of the other six. Idolatry is our crisis. And, and, And all the while, as we are worshiping our idols, as we're standing up for what we believe is right, we're neglecting something that's essential for the church to be effective and powerful in this culture. Somehow, in the midst of living on these extremes, we leave Jesus out. The very one we are trying to be effective for gets left out of our method of reaching the culture. You see, in the end, it's not about what I think is right, the right way to reach or engage the culture. It really is all about Christ. It's all about the one who is responsible for building his church in a way that Scripture says the gates of hell can't even keep people from being rescued from. It's all about Christ, and we, his people, we, his body, leave him out. Of the picture. I'm sorry, I had to offend you one more time. Worship team, will you come forward? We we sang a song earlier, and Mark, I'm going back to that at the end, the last slide. I don't think that I had ever really recognized this before, but as, we, as, as they were singing how great the Father's love for us this morning, it starts off with how great the Father's love, and then it proceeds to tell us all about what Christ has done for us. And, and the, the lyrics that, that captivated me this morning, that I said, we have to do again, were these lyrics, I will not boast in anything, but I'll boast in Jesus Christ. Will you stand this morning and let's boldly proclaim that. As we do, I want you to kind of think back through where you stand, where you are, and the way that you engage the culture. I want you to ask yourself, am I forcing or am I emphasizing my style of reaching the culture over someone else's and could my 
boldness to stand up for the way God has wired me? Could it be stopping the church, the body of a Christ, from being powerful and effective? When we're done singing this, we're going to go out of here recognizing that Jesus is in the middle of everything. Father God, thank you for helping us to see ourselves today the good, the bad, and the ugly. As we sang this song, we cannot help but think that it was not one of these models that rescued us. It wasn't someone's style of engaging the culture. That may have drawn us to you, but it was you who rescued us through the life, the death, and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Will you humble us? Will you get us out of the way? Will you get our ideals and our philosophies and our wisdom and our style? Get us out of the way so that the life of Jesus Christ can be lifted up and exalted to this culture. We know that we are just workers that are being sent into the harvest field. But it's not just any harvest field. It's your harvest field And we might do our part to sow or to water, but you're the one that it's all about. You're the one that reaps the harvest. This is not about us and what we think is right, God. And so forgive us for having our idols. Will you help us to lay our idols down? And lift Jesus Christ up. God, we know that if our heels are dug in and we aren't moving, that your church is not moving. Your kingdom's not moving. And so, God, we turn it over to you. We yield to you. We want to make you known. We want to make you the one who rescued each and every one of us in here. We want to make you known to a world that desperately needs rescued. Let's finish with these words. It's a quote by St. Patrick. And I hope that it reminds us as we leave that it is all about Jesus Christ. Christ with me. Christ before me. Will you read them with me? Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit down. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. Be Christ. Be Christ. We'll see you back here in a few short days.